Hey guys, how's it going? Everybody excited to be here? Yeah. Tell you what, this is our first time coming here. Really excited to see everything here. Uh, I am not traditionally a cat fisherman or crappie fisherman. I actually came from the professional world of bass fishing years and years ago. And so it's neat to be able to come here and see the interaction and, and ultimately the same thing. We all want to use electronics to catch more fish. What I want to cover today, what some of my goals are today, is to have you guys better understand how electronics can help you put ultimately more fish in the boat. But the one thing I want you guys to keep in mind, just because you spend money on electronics does not mean you're going to put more fish in the boat. You still got to catch them. But with the age of technology and how things are going, you can get as high tech nowadays with live scope system, literally watching your lure down in front of the fish. It's high tech, it's as close to video game fishing as you're gonna get with still using a rod and reel in your hand. One of the first things I wanna cover though is the installation piece behind this and some things that go into all electronics. I personally am not brand specific. I am not a representative from Garmin, Lowrance, or Hummingbird. Um, our company that we founded about six years ago does help all three of those manufacturers with development of new products. We do a lot of beta testing on, uh, here recently, new trolling motors, ironically enough, but the electronic portion behind that, sorry, I'll stay this way. We've done a lot of testing and stuff and a lot of development with these companies to help ultimately everybody, including myself, catch more fish. That's where I came from. I came from the professional side of bass fishing. Um, love to go out and catch fish. I'm really getting into crappie fishing now. I've got a son who's four. Um, it's a lot easier with live scope and some other uh, tools that are out there that we're, we're using and stuff. But one of the main things that we get that are routine calls out at the shop that I really want to cover for a basis is people that have issues with units not reading correctly, um, their screens tend to be flickering and stuff. And one of the things I want to cover is from the installation piece and setting yourself up for success. Whether you do the installation of the electronics on your boat or you have a dealer do it. Now, I'm not trying to badmouth any other dealer out there, but I want you guys to be aware a lot of times, not every time, there are some fantastic dealers out there, but a lot of times your local mom and pop dealership does not have the knowledge needed to properly install the electronics on your boat. I am not trying to talk bad about them or say that they don't know what they're doing at all. They're high tech. They require a lot of power. We've seen brand new boats come in with the wrong size trolling motor batteries in them. We've seen them come in with the wrong size cranking batteries in them, the wrong wiring done. It wasn't intentional, but you guys are spending a ton of money. You're trusting them to do it. Our hope is to educate you that if you're not doing your installation on your own, you're having a dealer do it, you can have some checks and balances there because we've seen a lot of people come in from out of town that I'm here out of town, I have a tournament, I have a problem, and it's ruining my fishing trip. And sometimes it's as simple as a blown fuse that they had no idea where the fuse was in the boat. They don't know any questions about how the installation was done. To start with, I want to say at bare minimum, everybody here that's got a boat that wants to do an installation for a cranking battery, you need a minimum of a 31 size group battery. I don't care if it's AGM, I don't care if it's a lead acid. I don't care if it's a lithium ion battery, that's 1200 bucks. The Group 31 battery, deep cycle, cranking engine is what you guys are gonna need. Not only for your electronics, but most of these new engines out here running the four strokes, they require the minimum cold cranking amps around 900 to 1000 just for the engine ECM itself. And the main thing that we run into on this morning, anything else, and the, a quick diagnostic tip real quick, if you ever go to start your engine and your unit flickers or it dims, you are running low on voltage. You either have too small a battery or you do not have the correct gauge wiring running to your unit. Now again, I know this stuff is a little bit dry, but I really feel this is a necessary thing because I promise you 90% of what we deal with with a unit related issue or an unhappy customer is because of the installation and a voltage related issue. When these units, which are ultimately computers, run low on voltage, they do some freaky stuff. I've seen units lock up on 2D sonar, mapping not work correctly, units flickering on and off repeatedly. A lot of times I say, I have a bad unit. I need a replacement unit. I need to call Lowrance or I need to call here. It's not anything related to that whatsoever. A lot of the time it's not a unit related issue. It's the voltage going to it. The main thing I want to cover on the voltage issue that's been problematic recently is a lot of guys are taking some older boats that had some older electronics on it and putting new high-tech electronics on it and they're using the same power cables or they're tapping into the same power source that their old five inch unit used to run. It was fine for a five inch unit, not for these new 10 inch, 12, 15 inch units that are out there as well too. 
run dedicated power from your cranking battery directly to each unit. Um, for example, we had a ProCat 240 came in, had four live units and a live scope that was on it. We had five sets of 10 gauge wire on that boat running from the crank battery all the way up. Now I know that seems redundant, it seems like a lot, but you eliminate so many potential problems out on the water. It's a lot of stuff running constantly, it's going to be a constant battery draw. We ended up installing two in, uh, batteries on that specifically for all the electronics and some talons and stuff. But the main thing I want to cover guys when it comes to this stuff, and I cannot say it enough, is I don't want you to have issues out on the water. You guys are spending your hard earned money going out on the water. The last thing you want to do is take a relaxing situation of going out and having some fun fishing and turning it real anxious and stressful and frustrating real, real quick. We've all been there. Another quick tip that I really recommend too, a lot of times on these installations, the power cable comes down and it has a fuse holder built right into it directly off the head unit. So you have head unit, the power cable for the head unit, and an inline fuse holder that where you tap into your power supply source from your 10 gauge power. Take that out. What we do at our shop and what we train all our new techs that go through our installation training program, we want all those fuses put right back by the cranking battery. Our techs will also take a label maker and they'll label each power cable of 10 gauge wire you've got in running to the unit. It would be console left, console right, live scope, bow unit, bow unit left, bow unit right, or bow unit top, bow unit bottom. All those fuses are right by the positive lead on the battery. So if you ever have an issue, you open one back compartment, bow top is not working correctly, pull right there, you immediately check the fuse. That's step you know, one of multiple of working through a system and procedure for having an issue. That way you're not tearing apart a dash, you're not tearing apart a bow panel on the lake, losing screws, losing tools where you're trying to do that. Trying to simplify how to rectify or solve a problem on the water. Regardless of any brand out there, power is your number one big influence with a lot of issues that we're seeing, voltage related specifically. Again, if you go to start that engine and you see a voltage, um, excuse me, if you see a unit flicker, or a lot of times the bow unit will shut off completely and you have to restart and you thought, huh, that was weird. It's because it's pulling all that voltage from anything it can to be able to turn your crank engine over. It's battery or you've got the wrong size cabling running for your units. Second thing that has been very, very important in terms of the quality of what you guys are gonna see on your side imaging, your down imaging, and your 2D sonar is making sure your, excuse me, your transducer is level in the water. Now what I mean by that is when you're mounting your transducer on your boat and you have your boat level on the trailer and you mount your transducer level, you're level on the trailer. But we all know, depending on how your boat is, it's not level in the water. The other key feature within that too is, I'll even go a step further. Your ideal side imaging and down imaging speed is three to five miles an hour. We've seen a lot of people that said, hey, I'm very frustrated with uh, my quality of my side imaging and my down imaging. I don't think it's up to par from what I've seen on Lawrence's website or Garmin's website or my buddies is so much better than mine and I'm trying to mirror the same settings and I don't understand why mine looks so terrible. It's because that three to five miles an hour, it'll make a difference. I've gone out with customers that are completely upset. My Humminbird was better. My Lawrence was better than this new stuff. You told me it'd be better. I go out and I see that. I said, send me a screenshot of what you're looking at. And always in the upper left hand corner is a mile an hour and I'll see some 1.1 mile an hour or 7.8 mile an hour. You're either too fast or too slow. What you have happen is your image gets distorted. If you are too slow, you are constantly taking slices of the exact same image and it's overlaying. You don't have enough spread between those. If you're too fast, you have too much of a gap between those slices from the return from that transducer. It's elongated. It's not as clear. So if you're idling a little bit too slow, try speeding up next time. You'd be surprised how much that improves that. Now getting back to what I was talking about on leveling your transducer, you need to find what your boat angle is at that three to five miles an hour to give you the best readings. We get a lot of people that say, my fish arches are big, they look pretty good, but man, that left side is so much further than the right side. Kick up the back end of that transducer a little bit so when that bow of that boat is up in the air, when you're idling along, it's going to be more even because that's the way you're idling around. The big thing that comes through a lot of this stuff is, is going to be an understanding of how you relate to what you're seeing under the water and how you can come back around and go fishing to it. Now, I didn't want to bring a slideshow here and show you that 
here's some really good side imaging shots or down imaging shots of trees from Garmin, Lowrance, and Hummingbird. We've all seen those, they're all great. I know a lot of people that post up on social media all the time, look at all the crappie in this tree, look at all the bass in this tree. I still don't see them with fish pictures. They still end up with a sunset picture at the end of the day. So my point being is when it comes to electronics and the high tech stuff, especially for you guys that are not used to running whether it's a complete change out, whether you've had Hummingbird before and you're now running Garmin, or you've had Lowrance before and you're now running Hummingbird, it's time on the water. Just like regular fishing, you gotta get out there, you gotta get a line wet. What I really recommend, the first half day or full day you have a new set of electronics or a new thing that you wanna go play with, leave the rods at home. Take your owner's manual with you, you'd be surprised how much stuff is in that owner's manual that you truly need to cover and look at. Play with the settings. The worst thing that's happened, you get the thing so messed up, you don't know what to do, go back and hit fa factory restore. Start them all over again. Tinker with the settings and have an understanding of the settings that you have out there. No one unit at no any given time is better than another. I've seen some really good side imaging come from a unit that supposedly weren't the best with side imaging images. You need to understand how to dial in those images. Most importantly, another thing that we get a call about when customers pick up their boat from us, I want you to put the settings on there so I never have to mess with them. I want them locked in. That's impossible. Every time we go out on the water, it's a different time for the most part, right? Back home, we live in mud flat lake. We've got a whole bunch of lakes that are built on old farm fields. It's dirty, it's dingy. But in February and March, right after ice out or winter time, that water's crystal clear. You're gonna see some of the best returns on side imaging and down imaging you've ever seen. And we always get five or 10 phone calls in about May or June when guys say, man, I went out crappie fishing in February and I could see so many crappie in a tree and now I'm just seeing a tree and I can't really see anything. Well, we've got three inches of visibility. In February, we had nine feet. That's a whole bunch of debris that you've got going in the water that your sonar or your down imaging or side imaging is attempting to go through. Not gonna make it, can't. Too much debris, too much clutter. So you're gonna have to go in and reduce your sensitivity on that to reduce the clutter. Well, high, and, and unfortunately, but reducing the sensitivity, you're also gonna lose a little bit of that fish as well too. You're gonna see less and less of them. So again, play with your settings. Understand what your settings are that what they're gonna do on your unit. Get comfortable with them. Um, how many of you guys here actually tournament fish? A few of you guys? Last thing you wanna be doing is on the water during a tournament having a misunderstanding of how something affects the fishing or fix your graph to understand that. You wanna make sure you have all the settings set up and you have an understanding of what you're doing before you even get out there. A lot of these graphs with the mapping, you can mark waypoints on the mapping based off of what you already know on what the fish should be doing or where they should be at. You can get as techy into this as you wanna get. I was talking to a gentleman earlier before this got started. These are computers, guys. No way, shape, or form, anywhere other thing about it. They have computer processors and a monitor. We are looking at computers. You can spend five grand on a computer and do nothing more than send an email or check Facebook messages or get on Facebook. You guys are spending sometimes five, 10, 15, 20 grand on electronics, and I can tell just by talking to some customers, they're gonna do nothing more than turn them on. You guys are doing a huge in service by not understanding what those units are doing. And there's some guys out there that really know them well and it's amazing what they can do. Time on the water with your units, not trying to fish, but actually time on the water and understanding what those settings do on those units affects those units. Ultimately, guys, I promise you, is gonna get put more fish in the boat. 10, 15 years ago, Lowrance, Humminbird, and Garmin all used to train us to train you and educate you guys in that when you are on side imaging, you are on down imaging in 2D sonar. If you idle past a brush pile, rock pile, or point, if you don't see fish arches on 2D sonar and you don't see white specks on your side imaging in there, you just go on. There's nobody home. Keep on trucking. It's going to make you more efficient, going to make you a better angler. You're going to maximize the time that you've got on your day on the water to make yourself more efficient. Don't waste your time. Well, with the aid of live scope and live sight, that's actually incorrect. There's been multiple times that I've pulled up to a brush pile, rock pile, don't see anything. Put live scope down, aim at it, still don't see anything. Hit your trolling motor around a few times, don't see anything. Finally, you cast a lure in there and you watch those fish come off that bottom, out of that structure, either away from your lure, they didn't like something about it, they didn't like the color, didn't like the lure, didn't like the action, or you see them come up and turn down and nose down on your lure. 
where 10 years ago, hell, even two months ago in the past, I'm gonna be an efficient angler, I'm gonna go off and take off. So there's some things that we've now learned over the past, I'm gonna say year, year and a half of live scope really being well out there that in the past, I thought I was doing the right thing by saving myself time, saving myself, you know, the energy, just running to spot, to spot, to spot. Now, the thing that I will say is more important than anything else is having the confidence on the water of knowing A, what you're looking at, and B, what sort of fish is down there. Me knowing that I've got a fish in that brush pile, even if I spooked it off, that's at least going to waypoint, Matt, to know that there is something there. It's going to give me the confidence to go back and fish that a little bit later on if I spook that fish out. Or if I throw in there and that fish nose is down, it's going to give me confidence to cast in there multiple times until I get that fish to react or bite. I'm going to give it more time. You know, years ago with bass fishing, we always had the joke, you know, you throw in a brush pile five or six times, nobody home, on to the next. A lot of times there was a fish in there. More times than not, I promise you, there's fish in there. We used to go when I was a kid, sink brush piles, Grand Lake, El Dorado, um, some other lakes around the area. It's what everybody did to have the advantage. You know, and guys used to kind of complain about it, like, oh, well, he's got more time to go out and sink brush piles. I don't want to fish against him in a tournament because he's got his old honey holes out there. I don't even do that anymore. I don't need to do that. You can go idle across the flat and find anything and everything you want in about 15 minutes if you're out 150 feet or 200 feet aside on side imaging. And it's funny how much that stuff actually changes. You waypointed something 10, 15 years ago, the current will drag it. Or years ago, guys used to carry a huge treble hook and a two ounce weight. They'd snag it and move it themselves. <laughs> you know, move it away if they found your stuff. But this thing with technology, we have to remember, it's the most important thing. I'm gonna back away from that speaker. I think I found my crack I can't walk past. Is when it comes to the technology stuff, it can get overwhelming. I like to always tell people, keep it simple, stupid. It's the kiss rule when it comes to fishing. A fish is still a fish, right? Still got to catch them. I think the majority of people in here, myself included, if you're around fish, you're probably going to catch them. The thing with the technology that I remind people is use the technology that is out there available to help you put yourself around fish. We've got all the latest and greatest rods and reels out there, the baits, the lines, the hooks all to catch more fish. We're spending thousands and thousands of dollars to go after stuff that ultimately swims in the lake. We all enjoy it, we all love it. It can be frustrating at times when it comes to electronic stuff. So I think there's a lot of things we can do as anglers, whether it's from the installation piece, whether it's the understanding the electronics that you guys have on your boat and utilizing how it works, whether it's a total boat system where some guys, they've got electronics that are wired to their trolling motor, they've got them linked up, they're, they're running a, a flat, they're running a contour line, they're running a waypoint line, whatever you want to call it. We still got to go fishing, we still got to put yourself around the fish. If you can utilize your electronics a lot of the time to really make that easy. Years ago, we all used to look like, oh, there's some fish there, there's some fish here. You're right, there are. But if you put yourself in the time of year, for example, bass fishing, and I talk about bass fishing because it's what I know, it's what I came from. This time of year, I'm gonna be in creek channels. I wanna look for a bend in a creek channel. I could mark 25 bends in a creek or a river channel before I ever leave my house. I'm gonna get there, and I'm gonna check those areas out first. I am also a believer that there is a type of fish that are always deep, there's a type of fish that are always shallow, and then you've got the type of fish that move transient between the two, depending on the time of year. If you put yourself in how you like to fish, you can mark those on mapping, these, the, some of this stuff is, is so high tech, guys. You can shade different depth lines. Zero to five feet can be red on your map. Five to 10 feet can be yellow. 10 to 15 feet can be green. And the colors are, are endless, truthfully. But again, with this high tech stuff, it can get overwhelming and quick. Break it down, simplify it. If you need to spend multiple days out on the water, just look at side imaging. Spend multiple days only doing side imaging. Spend multiple days only mapping in 2D sonar, whatever it is. You guys are investing a ton of money in this stuff, you need to invest a lot of time in learning this stuff that'll help you. It'll click, I promise you. I had a 78 year old man that spent $10,000 on electronics two years ago. His son thought he was insane. I kind of did too. And he called me about three weeks after we installed the stuff on his Ranger boat and he was frustrated. He was pretty pissed, honestly. He said, I can't figure it out. I said, Rodney, have you ever gone out and not used uh, a rod and reel? He goes, well, no, I'm a farmer. I only go out when it's raining. Well, 
I want to go fishing when I go out. So leave the rods at home. So here's the deal. You give me an honest two days out on the water with no rods and reels and truly trying to understand this stuff, you're not happy? I'll put your old stuff back on your boat. I'll take that off. I'll give you your money back. No harm, no foul. He said, all right, can't beat that. First time he went out, he called me. He was still frustrated. He was trolling, so he obviously had rod and reel out there. I said, reel it up, take it in. I said, I'll call your son if I have to, and I'll make him come get your rods off your boat. He took the rods off the boat, and I told him, don't look at 2D sonar, don't look at anything else. Go to a lake where you know something is there. You may not know what it is, but go where you think it's a rock pile, you think it's a brush pile, I don't care if it's a boat dock or a car. Go to the lake, part of the lake, where it's something you know something is there, and all I want you to do is idle back and forth past it and keep a, an eye on it, then look at what it is. He did that. He went into a marina on a local lake that I know very, very well. There's a lot of rock piles down there, old dock anchors and dock cables. He came off the water that afternoon. He said, you know what? I think I got something figured out. He think, I think I know what fish look like on here. I said, okay. So what do you want to do now? He goes, can I have my rods back? <laughs> so gave him his rods back. He came in the next day, really, really excited. And it was something so simple that I'd tell the story because it made all the difference in the world with him with how he fished. It gave him the confidence to know with what he had found the day before he could go duplicate on the lake. At different parts of the lake, it, it was his aha moment, his click moment. And what the whole thing that basically happened was he idled past a point and he saw three little white dots. We call them rice grains, if you will. You look for three rice, rice grains or the rice grains in a shadow, it's a fish. It's different than a rock. It looks different than a rock, but it's very difficult until either somebody actually shows you what it is or you realize what it is on your own. He said, I idled past a point, I saw three rice grains on there, and I caught two wiper. He said, I idled past the point, I only saw one rice grain on there, didn't catch anything. He said, I turned back around, idled one more time, I caught another wiper. I idled past the point, he goes, you know what, there was nothing there, you know why? They were in my live well. There's things that we can do again as anglers with this tech stuff that I think is extremely important when it comes to this. It's time on the water. It's been that way for fishing, whether you had electronics or not. The days of just being able to take a cane pole and a little bobber and go walking down the bank, you're still gonna catch a few. But as we as anglers have get more and more out there, the fish themselves are getting more and more educated. When I fish bass tournaments, you go down to Grand Lake, you can catch the hell out of them on a Tuesday or Wednesday and it gets a little tougher every day because that weekend gets closer. You've got 100 engines running constantly. The other thing I will say too is I had a huge misunderstanding at how much a trolling motor or noise will affect fish. And this new age of technology helps me be more effective as an angler because I understand how much noise, whether it's certain lakes of the year, for example, Table Rock Lake. I experienced this my first time. I was in 35 feet of water catching fish on a drop shot and a jigging spoon out of treetops. The treetops are coming up about 20 feet below the bottom of the boat. You can see the fish on live scope kind of moving through the treetops. I took a pair of pliers, like I always did. I was on the front deck of my boat. Just turned them through them between my two consoles. That way the pair of pliers wouldn't fly out if I ever just jumped up on the big engine. Well, when I did that, I was happening to be catching a glimpse of my live scope. When the pliers hit the floor of my boat, I watched the fish scatter out of the tree I was over the top of. I was amazed how slamming lids or closing lids on a boat or just kicking a lid over with your foot, they hear you. 35 foot down, they hear you. It's super clear water. Table rocks, 30, 35 foot visibility in a lot of places, so it's super, super clear water. But yeah, made a big, big difference. The other thing you'll notice too, we went out with uh, the engineer that developed LiveScope at Garmin actually on Hillsdale Lake to go crappie fishing. He was taking us out crappie fishing. We were going over some stuff. We went over on top of a brush pile. We were 20 feet away from a brush pile and 20 feet of water. When I hit that trolling motor prop, you would watch the fish scatter. And then you slowly watch them come back in. It took about 15, 20 seconds and we could go back to catching them. But with the age of the new trolling motors, we're not on the trolling motors as much, so it's not as conscious. I get a lot of people say, hey, I'm not on my trolling motor, but man, my batteries are running down. Well, what kind of trolling motor do you have? Tarova, Ultera, Ultrax, or I got a new Ghost or a Forest. Well, you're physically not on the trolling motor a lot, but when you're anchored out, that thing's going constantly, so you're wearing down your batteries. You may not realize how that's affecting the fish, but touching that trolling motor pedal, whether it's correcting the steering, moving the boat positioning, affects those fish. I mean, it's, it's so much to me of how it affects those fish, 
I don't even say it's as much of a hearing thing for them as much as there are a lot of their lateral lines will actually feel the vibration going through the water. That's what I think from my experience anyway. But a lot of that stuff all adds up. We want to catch more fish, bigger fish. Bigger fish are smart. They're older. They've been around the block for a time or two. There's a lot of little things that if you were paying attention to your electronics and help you clue you in on. Had I not been looking at my live scope screen when I merely threw a pair of pliers down on the bottom of my boat, I would have never done that. I'd still be throwing pliers down there. I mean, I know I can't name anybody I personally fish with that doesn't do that normally or throws a net down in the bottom of the boat or drops a, a rod down in the bottom of the boat. The fish hear that. They know you're there. They know something's not right. Something's not natural. So the more we can do with these electronics, there's a lot of things that come into play with this stuff that we have that we can utilize that a lot of times initially I didn't think made a big deal. I didn't realize, but electronics helped me realize that stuff and ultimately help us catch more fish. I've put more bigger bass in the boat fishing tournaments in the past three years than I ever have in my life because of electronics. I can see where they are. I can see where they live. And if I'm not catching them that time, I at least know something's in there. I can come back to it. There was a time I actually, uh, this past um, August, I weighed in 20 pounds in a tournament. Ended up leading after the first day. Caught them on top water, but I actually used live scope to help me catch those fish. A lot of people didn't know that was possible. I didn't know what those fish were at the time. I was fishing grass flats, but I knew something was there cruising and I could see where it was cruising to and I could cast ahead of it to get that way. Sometimes that fish would turn off and you'd watch it turn, car, drum, walleye, wiper. Other times they'd turn and come right back at it and explode on it. it happened to be a large mouth and small mouth, which is what I was going for. I called 22 times that day in the tournament. Second place after the first day had 13 pounds. So some little nuances can make a big, big difference. So pay attention to your grass when you learn them. It's, it's worth their time. You guys are spending more than enough money on them that you guys work a long time and hard to earn. Use them to your best advantage that you can. You'd be surprised what you can see and find on that stuff. I don't care if you're Humminbird, Garmin, Lowrance, Raymarine, older brand out there, does not matter. They're all good. They are all good. You have to figure out no different than any other boat out there. You guys pick your boat out for how you do your fishing and what makes sense. It's the same thing for electronics. Guys that are out wiper fishing or guys that want to find bait, a 360 imaging unit in a Hummerbird may be the greatest thing for you because you can constantly see where the shadow moved around the boat. If you're like me, you want to see in the target. You don't have a problem finding the targets on side imaging, but you want to see in a brush pile what's going on. I like live scope for that. I run a conglomerate on my boat. I don't have just one specific thing. I run Lowrance and Garmin. We sell to guys that run Humminbird Garmin, all Humminbird, all Garmin, all Lowrance. The brand doesn't matter. What matters is you guys learning and understanding and understanding how those electronics can help you put more fish in the boat and truly figuring it out. That's what matters. We always get people a call year after year. Well, Garmin's got new stuff. I want to get rid of all my Lowrance and go that way. I still don't catch fish. I got all Humminbird or Humminbird came out with something new. I want to get rid of all this. The brand ain't going to help you catch fish. The understanding of what you got will help you catch fish. The last thing I want to hint on here, I want to talk about when it comes to boats and boat setup, regardless if it's aluminum boat, fiberglass boat, concoction of the two, is when it comes to the transducer selection on here, most of these units are going to be fantastic units set up right out of the box installation of the transducer location matters a lot. Don't always trust the dealer that you guys are taking boats to that they're going to know more than you. A lot of times they got a guy that's a rigger that's 10 bucks an hour. He's just not afraid to drill in a hole in a boat and you guys are. And it's understandable, I get that. But that doesn't mean they're always going to know exactly what they're doing or where the best placement for transducer is or how to wire things up correctly. Again, I don't get real big on brands. I'm I know a lot about a lot of the different brands that are out there. I'm happy to answer any question that you guys have. Um, if you guys have some questions and answers, I'd love to answer them here. If we get too long a time, our booth right there at the very end, we got a Garmin uh, banner up there. Love to answer any questions or go over some real specific stuff. Um, had a gentleman today that said, man, I've been fighting an issue for six months. I don't understand this about my graph. It was two settings that were off on his graph, but he was fighting it for six months. We know a lot about a lot of the different stuff on the graphs, guys. Don't be afraid to answer us. Um, I've got business cards over there, some flyers and stuff. So if you guys have questions, again, regardless of the brand, send us a message, email us or call us. Our staff's great. We'd love to talk to you guys about any of that stuff. Anybody have any questions off the top of their head now that they'd like to get answered on any of it? I do. Yes, sir. Sure do. Yep. 
We got all three, Humminbird, Garmin, and Lorance are on display down there. No questions, really? Damn. Yeah, yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. Main thing is that reserve capacity on your battery. You want. Question was, two-stroke outboard have enough uh, charging coming through than the alternator, charge crank battery, all that stuff? Absolutely, yeah, not a problem at all. Sure, sure. 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 Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. You can do it running actually. Um, the ideal imaging speed though, where the transducers are actually designed and the, the processor in the unit is designed is that three to five mile for your ideal imaging. Now I've got a couple guys that are on our pro staff that run the uh, uh, PB tour, professional bass tour. We've got their transducers mounted and I do not recommend this, but we've got them mounted. They will be up on plane about 18, 19 mile an hour still seeing imaging for what you just described. They're looking only for structure. That's it. That's the only thing they care about. And they don't care if they rip off a four or $500 transducer either. But that's the only thing they're looking to do is find structure. They're just like that. So you won't see fish doing that, but you can find some structure and at least revert back around and then slow down and re-idle it over and mark what you want to mark. Well, and here's another tip that I recommend too. And again, this is from my perspective for bass fishing, what I recommend. If you are marking a tree, I do three things. I waypoint it three times. One end, center juice, other end. What I want to find out more than anything else is I want to see how that tree is laid out. If I'm going through with a crankbait or a jig, I want to be on the outside of that throwing to the tree top, coming through the tree top. What I don't want to be is down off the trunk of the tree, throwing through the tree top, coming through it, because what you'll have happen, as you get in those tree branches, your lure gets wedged in between the trees, and all you end up doing is shaking the hell out of the tree, trying to pop it free, and you've literally spooked every fish out of that tree. Then you automatically have to go all the way around the boat or all around the front of the tree to retrieve your lure. That spot's done for at least 30 minutes. You need to let that rest and come back around. So if I know how that tree's laid out and how my waypoints are on my map, I can spin around to make myself more efficient with fishing that. And I always ease into my stuff. If I know there's the juice, the middle, I will hit it first. If I know that tree is directly where the tree branches are meeting the trunk, that's gonna be my first cast. Oftentimes, not every time, oftentimes, your first time hitting that piece of structure, the biggest fish is gonna bite first in my experience. That's mine personally. I've had to fish around some structure before and you catch a couple little ones and you'll catch a bigger one, but nine times out of 10 in my experience of tournament fishing, you throw in there, you hit the juice the way that you should hit it, the bigger fish is gonna hit first.